Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm very proud to be here with uh, my colleague and friend, Professor Peter Kanu. And uh, today we are speaking about uh, the uh, rare but uh, nevertheless very important uh, part of pediatric orthopedic practice. I mean rare diseases, uh, how to diagnose and what to do and uh, the new perspectives uh, in uh, rare diseases uh, in the daily pediatric orthopedic practice. And uh, let me start with the um, short introduction of the problem. Um, I think you can see my screen. Pardon me. This is the wrong presentation. The rare bone diseases, uh, they uh, seem to be re uh, rare when we are speaking about the specific entities. But when we are talking about rare bone diseases as the whole problem, uh, they uh, don't look uh, so rare as uh, they can look from the first glance. And today we speak about uh, uh, fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva as uh, one of the problems. Uh, but uh, first of all, I want to, uh, to uh, focus uh, our attention on the general um, uh, picture of the pediatric uh, uh, genetic conditions. If we look at this list of the uh, classical pediatric orthopedic conditions, uh, we can be sure that uh, in the daily practice we can um, contact with the um, genetic conditions which can mimic or include the most common orthopedic disorders. And uh, why should we remember the basic uh, principles of uh, uh, skeletal biology uh, before we diagnose and uh, manage uh, skeletal uh, uh, diseases? Uh, first of all, because of diagnostic awareness. To um, uh, diagnose better, we have to understand what uh, and how we diagnose it. Uh, for the um, basic principle of medicine, non ulcerate, don't uh, make harm, because some interventions are harmful, some uh, uh, routine interventions are harmful in rare skeletal conditions, and because of some extra interventions are necessary in the specific conditions. Diagnostic awareness includes uh, screening uh, neonatal age-dependent and periodical uh, programs, uh, which uh, depending on the country are differing, uh, different from country to country, from the uh, hospital to hospital. We have to remember the uh, diagnostic red flags, uh, uh, which uh, include unique or very typical signs. And we have to use the Gestalt principle. We have to generate diagnostic hypothesis in absence of complete information. And in rare conditions, so we, uh, in the most of situations, we don't have the complete information. And surveillance programs uh, for progressive conditions also um, very uh, much depending on, on the understanding of basic principles of skeletal biology. And of course, uh, uh, prognosis, uh, both pr pr personal and, and prognosis for the family, are uh, also import, uh, important and depending on the basic principles of skeletal genetics and skeletal biology. The um, uh, principle, diagnostic principle, which uh, radiologists call antmini, is one of the um, um, most important uh, in the uh, uh, diagnosis of rare disease. It, it's referred to a uh, famous American uh, radiologist, Edward uh, Duncan Neuhauser, which, uh, which, uh, who said, if you knew well uh, Aunt Minnie, then you would easily recognize her in a crowd. And the more um, uh, red flags, the more uh, pathological signs we, we know, it, the more we remember, the more we look, uh, the easier we uh, recognize uh, the uh, uh, rare skeletal conditions. And the principle non ulcerae is also very much related to the rare skeletal conditions. For example, bisphosphonates are dangerous and harmful in some conditions like hypophosphatasia, pycnodisostosis, and hypercalcemia of any uh, origin. Vitamin D is also generally contraindicated in, in hypophosphatasia, despite of hypophosphatasia is a, is a part of Ricketts' uh, spectrum. Um, surgery and fractures in osteoporosis have high risk of deformity, uh, 
and in osteosclerosis uh, they have high risk of non-union and uh, increased ossification like uh, FOP and or progressive uh, ossal uh, hyperplasia um, uh, uh, are also strongly uh, contraindicated to for the any kind of surgery and poor ossification like in uh, neurofibromatosis uh, um, yeah, surgery needs some osteoinduction and uh, some extra interventions are, which are necessary for rare skeletal conditions are also depend on the basic principles of uh, diagnosis and management and uh, disease modifying therapy for treatable conditions like hematopoietic stem cells uh, uh, transplantation, enzyme replacement transplantation, small molecules, inhibitors, monoclonal antibodies in final gene therapy are quite available now for many of the genetic conditions and special approach to prevention management uh, of uh, fractures and deformities. Also depends strongly on the genetic origin of the condition and uh, lifelong conditions varying along, along the uh, lifespan. And uh, now I mm, uh, want to introduce again uh, one of the leading uh, skeletal geneticists, uh, my uh, friend and colleague, Professor Peter Kano, for the introduction and his uh, talk. Uh, thank you, Professor Kenneth. I will uh, just wait so that I can share my screen. Okay. So um, good, uh, good evening, everyone. It's my real pleasure to talk about uh, this condition called Fibrosificans progressiva, uh, which is a condition that I've known for probably about 15 years. I'm a pediatrician and a clinical geneticist, and I practice uh, in Canada, and I look after uh, children and adults affected uh, by this very, very rare condition, which has an incidence of about, you know, one in two million to one in one and a half million. So in Canada, we know at least of about 20 individuals that are affected by FOP. Uh, these are my disclosures for my talk. So. Uh, Fibrosificans progressiva is a genetic condition. Uh, we call it an autosomal dominant condition, meaning that only one gene in a copy is affected and causes the disease, but very rarely is this condition inherited. Most of the mutations that occur in the ACVR1 gene are de novo, so these are gene changes that occur at the time of conception. Uh, and simply, uh, the condition is so incapacitating that affected individuals generally uh, reproduce. So when you look at this particular gene, it's not a very large gene. There are 509 amino acids, as are shown here. And there's a particular mutation hotspot the R206 change here, uh, which, uh, which I've highlighted here, which is really the hot spot, and probably about 90% of affected individuals have this common mutation. The remaining 10 have a, a, a number of different mutations right sp uh, spaced around the gene, and their presentations tend to be uh, what we call atypical, and so they deviate from uh, the normal sort of presentation. So what is this ACVR1 gene? The ACVR1 gene is, is something that is important in uh, BMP signaling. And as we all know, BMP signaling is important in bone formation. And what happens, uh, as is seen in, in uh, uh, slide D here, is that the mutated receptor is hyperactive. And it leads to switching on of signaling on the BMP pathway, leading to inappropriate deposition of bone in response to some sort of traumatic event. So as we all know, there's two ways that bone can be made in the body. It can either be a direct process where there's a differentiation of a stem cell into an osteoblast, an intramembrous ossification, which is what happens in our flat bones, as opposed to the long bone process, which is endochondral ossification. And this is distinguished by that fibrocartilage callus phase before there's mineralization. So the bone formation in uh, heterotopic ossification and FOP is driven mainly through the endochondral ossification phase. So this is a, a schema here showing the normal ACVR1 receptor. And so what happens in the normal situation is that you've got these heterodimers of ACVR1 and phosphorylated BMP receptors that exist on the membrane of a cell. And in the absence of the ligand, 
uh, these heterocomplexes do not signal at all. Next, when BMP here, as shown in figure B, uh, is attached to the receptor, it promotes the heterodimerization of these complexes. So this could either be the wild type receptor or the FOP mutant receptor, and it results in signaling through the SMAD 1, 5, and 8 pathway. And there's evidence that this is the signaling that occurs when you get sort of heterotopic ossification in response to non-FOP settings, for example, in trauma. Now, when the receptor is mutated, for example, by that common R206 mutation, the receptor is, is termed a neomorph. So the variant in the receptor, or the mutation in the receptor, results in a dominant gain of gene function, which results in a different function for the gene. And this time, when the heterotimers of wild type ACBL1 and corresponding type 2 BMP receptors are formed, they are non signaling complex results. But in the FOP situation, there is ongoing phosphorylation of the 158 SMAD pathway, which drives the entire uh, HO process or heterotopic ossification process in FOP. So, how does this process occur. The first phase is very similar to what we get in a normal sort of inflammatory response where you've got a proliferation of lymphocytes and white cells that come to the area uh, that are basically there to clear away whatever has been degraded or, or injured by the inflammatory process. And typically the body should then go into a healing phase, but inappropriately so in FOP, you, you have this anabolic phase here in stage two where the, uh, the cells that that are remaining inappropriately differentiate the fibroblasts from chondrocytes and then they go through this endochondral ossification process where they hypertrophy and they are either replaced by osteoblasts or mineralized to become more osteoblasts and you have heterotopic ossification of newborn formation. Uh, one of the key features of FOP and I think if anything if, if folks take home from this talk if you see a baby with a, a malformed toe like this, which some people may call a bunion, always think about a rare condition called FOP. Uh, and I think that's the single one take home message that I would like everyone to, to, to remember from this talk today. So this abnormal toe malformation in FOP has always uh, uh, intrigued me because, as I've uh, told you, the process is mainly characterized by inappropriate ossification. So why are the toes malformed? Well, if we look a bit deeper into the whole signaling pathway, we know that joint development uh, is very dependent on the BMP pathway, which is a key regulation of patterning and skeletal growth and chondrogenesis. So it's the disruption in this BMP signaling pathway during embryogenesis that causes the malformed big toe that uh, babies often present with, which can be mistaken as a bunion or a congenital bunion. This is some mouth data here trying to illustrate what actually happens in the body. Uh, so uh, what occurs is that this mutant ACVR1 receptor leads to delayed and disrupted joint specification and cleavage of the joints. And it basically alters the development of cartilage endochondral ossification at sites of joint morphogenesis. So looking more closely into a set of just sim the simplified diagram where you've got four uh, figures over here, the first two reflect the forelimb and the second two reflect the hind limb. And if you look at the mutant and you look at the immunohistochemistry uh, 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 distribution of the signal, when you look at it at E13.5 in the mouse embryo, you notice this very characteristic specification here where you can see the interzones of the joint. Uh, and this is completely lost in the mutant. And again, in the hind limb, you see that nice specification here of signaling, which is again completely lost in the mutant. So this is signaling for phosphor SMAD 1 and 5, which is in a typically normal situation restricted to discrete regions within the digit ray. Whereas in the mutants, this whole uh, sort of normal uh, distribution of the phosphor lost. 
So the joint cavitation and progressive specification of the joint tissues also depends very much on GDF5 expressing cells. We know that GDF5 uh, mutations in humans results in a condition called symphalangism where you don't get uh, joint formation properly. So we know that G, uh, GDF5 must be important in uh, this process in FOP as well. And indeed, this is in situ hybridization figures again embryos and I want you to concentrate on the figure A uh, which is the normal situation and B which is the mutant and look at the the difference in GDF5 expression you see that in the Y type you see this very nice specification of the interzones whereas that is completely lost in the uh, in the mutant picture the figure in C just shows the sense control strand which is a which is a control and it should be blank so to summarize the data as to so far, we know that this impaired digit specific joint uh, development, which is uh, characteristic of FOP, is the result of an ACVR1 mediated BMP phenomena. And there's a direct link between the failure to restrict BMP signaling in the digit zone, interzone, and failure of joint cleavage in the presumptive interzone. So with that, I want to finish my first part of the presentation and uh, uh, allow Dr. Kenneth to come back to resume his talk. Thank you, Peter. Thank you so much for your great presentation and uh, very clear explanation of the pathways which uh, uh, are um, lying behind the very important part of the FOP, which uh, is uh, mostly um, not very uh, uh, well recognized by the orthopedic surgeon. Can you see my uh, uh, if uh, my, my screen, I hope? And uh, I will combine my two talks about ossification and calcification with the uh, clinical um, uh, description of the FOP, and then we will move to the uh, current trends in medical treatment. And uh, after this great introduction of the basics again about the function of the bone. Bone is not only the support of the, of the human body. Bone uh, plays a, a very important role in the metabolism as well. And uh, classically, uh, the um, bones are traditionally associ associated with the most ancient species uh, because uh, uh, this impression comes from the fact that the body remains are better preserved in these sediments uh, and they mostly found by paleontologists. But in fact, the bones appeared not too early during the evolution. And the earliest bones were very different from the human skeleton. And uh, in the prehistoric part, past, the bone was more likely concrete and was uh, uh, outside of the, of the, uh, the body of the uh, the old species and the first bone with living cells like those uh, like in humans uh, was um, working not uh, only as the protection shell, uh, uh, shield but mostly as the skeletal batteries uh, and supplied uh, the, the moving uh, fish with the minerals for the better movement. Um, the bone formation begins at uh, quite early at the sixth or seventh weeks of gestation and uh, uh, continues until 25, uh, roughly 25 years. And uh, as uh, Peter mentioned, um, there are two ways of bone formation which also should be um, remembered because uh, uh, the um, understanding of this uh, way uh, of the formation is a key to the diagnosis of some conditions. For example, intramembranous ossification, uh, which involving uh, a condensed mesenchymal cells uh, that directly ossify. Uh, um, uh, we know that um, uh, intramembranous bones uh, mostly produce craniofacial bones and uh, flat bones and some uh, part of clavicles. And some classical orthopedic, orthopedic conditions like uh, cladocranial dysplasia uh, because, uh, because of abnormal membrane ossification and the constellation of the uh, specific signs of this uh, intramembrane uh, impaired ossification is the key to the diagnosis of, of cladocranial dysplasia. On the other hand, in the chondral dis, uh, ossification, uh, which uh, consists of uh, the transformation of cartilaginous template, cartilaginous and lagia, uh, to the uh, defin de definitive bone is mostly resembles to the 
uh, uh, longitudinal bone growth and uh, uh, primary um, and, uh, impairment of end control ossification mostly impairs the longitudinal bones and leads to the different types of the uh, short stature and deformities. And pathogenic variants in uh, uh, the majority of the genes which are related to the um, construction of the bone to the endochondral and, uh, and the membrane nose ossification can lead to different types of skeletal uh, dysplasia, like, for example, uh, mutations in, in comp gene leads to pseudochondroplasia and multiple epiphyseal dysplasia, and uh, mutations in, uh, in fibroblast growth factor receptor type 3 leads to achondroplasia. Why we have to know this uh, quite uh, deep fact, but uh, this is important, for example, for the planning of the management. Um, FGFR3 mutations in achondroplasia lead to met mostly metaphysial changing with uh, mostly normal bone and articular cartilage. Uh, but in um, comp mutation, which lead to pseudochondroplasia, which is I did show on this picture, uh, look, they look quite similar with short stature and um, uh, deformity and the shortening of the proximal parts of the limbs um, also lead to abnormal bone and articular cartilage and um, bone lengthening for example in a chondroplasia which mostly impairs uh, the metaphyseal part the growth plate it gives quite uh, good results mostly and uh, uh, most of uh, the attempts to lengthen the bone in pseudochondroplasia leads to poor results with the early degeneration of the articular cartilage. The steps of bone formation include osteoblasts, uh, um, which produce the osteoid alkaline phosphatase, in, um, um, is, uh, is the enzyme which is uh, important for the mineralization, and osteoclasts. Uh, they remodel the bone and this interplay between the osteoblasts and osteoclasts uh, is uh, the uh, important part of the uh, lifelong bone uh, remodeling. And uh, construction and deconstruction, bone modeling and remodeling of the bones um, help to maintain mechanical homeostasis. It seems to that the most uh, strong the bone, the better for the protection, for the um, weight bearing, for the resistance to the loading. But if bones uh, becomes too heavy, if bones becomes too strong, uh, first of all, it, uh, it, it impairs the movement. And the second, uh, the strong bones is also prone to the um, to the fractures. Soft bones can be uh, um, deformed and the dense bone can be broken, like in this example with the plastic and uh, um, uh, with the glass and the, with the uh, with the glass and uh, the, uh, the uh, mechanical properties depends only uh, not only on the uh, the amount of the bone but also on the mineralization. Poor mineralization of the osteoid leads to the uh, um, tendency to the deformity and the poor matrix formation also leads to the uh, tendency to the deformity. Poor mineralization, for example, in the different types of rickets uh, gives uh, the uh, wide spectrum of the deformities and the uh, poor matrix formation, for example, like in uh, different types of osteogenesis imperfecta uh, in, in um, almost normal mineralization also the, uh, leads to the different uh, spectrum of the different of the deformities. And um, uh, bone formation uh, also depends on the process of the mineralization. In fact, it's calcification. And increased calcification leads to the uh, uh, strengthening of the uh, bone in, in a normal um, uh, uh, in normal uh, biology, but increased uh, uh, the, uh, uh, increased ossification, pathologically increased ossification leads to a different type of the um, of calcification leads to different type of the disorders. The same uh, story with the is increased ossification when the uh, bone formation, the, when with the formation of the uh, os, uh, specific uh, ocell tissue um, is uh, also can be uh, uh, part of the spectrum of the um, pathological conditions. Increased bone mineral density is one of the keys to the diagnosis uh, and the treatment of different uh, conditions with uh, increased and decreased uh, mineralization.
uh, and the treatment modality, modalities uh, uh, strongly uh, depend on the um, specific pattern and specific pathway of the uh, abnormal mineralization and ossification. And uh, there is a growing and expanding list of treatable conditions related to the bone metabolism. I don't uh, want to uh, to uh, stop uh, on the, all of this condition because today we speak mostly about the FO, uh, uh, FOP and uh, fracture healing and the biology of fracture healing is also a part of spectrum of uh, the uh, conditions which strongly which which depend on the uh, um, our uh, the, the success of the tr of the treatment is very much depending on the on the uh, on how deep we understand uh, the biology behind. For example, uh, bone morphogenic protein, which uh, was uh, already uh, today uh, mentioned and we will mention again because it is, it is strongly re uh, related to the uh, FOP uh, pathway um, and uh, BMP now is uh, widely uh, used in adult orthopedic, uh, orthopedic surgery and in some branches of pediatric orthopedic surgery, uh, like for example, uh, from recently in a uh, mm, very difficult topic of uh, mm, uh, congenital pseudoarthrosis of tibia. Uh, and um, mm, the understanding of the pathways uh, of uh, the bone uh, bio bi uh, biological um, <clears throat> Uh, uh, conditions in normal and pathology uh, uh, is uh, uh, key to the success in uh, our uh, daily practice, uh, despite of uh, the, um, that it seems uh, that it is not um, so important uh, for, for, for the uh, surgery. And now I'm, um, mm, I, I want to speak uh, about, uh, before Peter will tell you about the um, current trends in um, uh, uh, medical treatment of the FOP. I want to speak briefly about the clinical uh, um, features of FOP and how we have to diagnose it. As Peter said, the, um, the first uh, um, orthopedic sign, which is uh, the re uh, definitely the red flag for FOP, is uh, the congenital hallux valgus. And um, here is the, the email from one of my patients, which I got a couple of years ago. Uh, they said that uh, um, the child was diagnosed in, in the in neonatal de uh, department with the congenital malformation of the first of the grade twos, and uh, yeah, the, the baby was referred to the orthopedic surgeon. They found uh, um, my email address in the internet of our department, and uh, the patient just asked about uh, how uh, early, uh, at, at what age, they, we, we can fix the deformity. And the first, uh, when I saw the, um, the the pictures, I asked for the radiographs. Fortunately, they had, and already at the age of few months. And uh, I did refer the uh, the baby to the geneticist. Not I did not uh, start to speak about surgery. I did refer to the geneticist. It was not uh, easy to explain to the parents, which asked the uh, orthopedic surgeon just about how to fix this, the minor deformity, the uh, congenital uh, valgus uh, of the of the grade two. And in uh, uh, according to the uh, the rule of the second case, in few weeks I got the second email from the very different region of Russia uh, with more or less the same question. Uh, when uh, should we come for the surgery of uh, the minor deformity of the great tools of our baby? And again, I did refer the patients to the uh, geneticist, and in both cases, uh, ACBR1 uh, um, uh, mutation, gene mutation was confirmed uh, the years before the first ossification progressed. And um, now um, about the uh, orthopedic manifestations of FOP, uh, there are four uh, generally uh, detected um, orthop orthopedic conditions related to the FOP. Uh, congenital anomalies of the feet and hands, heterotopic ossification itself, developmental um, anomalies of the cervical spine, and secondary orthopedic disorders like contractures and deformity. 
In general, hallux valgus in FOP is a essential uh, diagnostic failure. It's, it is the earliest clinical sign before the appearance of uh, heterotopic ossifications, the years before the heterotopic ossifications appeared, so we can diagnose, easily diagnose uh, the FOP. When we did um, the retrospective uh, survey of uh, our cohort of more than 40 patients with FOP, uh, in an, um, almost 95% a percent of patients, uh, the congenital hallux valgus was detected in the neonatal department or in the maternity home or by the nurse of primary care. Uh, so within the first days or weeks of life. And the diagnosis formally can be made uh, as early as the, the deformity was detected. But in fact, in, uh, um, in, in the same cohort, only three cases, including the two uh, which I did show, were detected before the heterotopic ossification started uh, uh, later during their life. And um, um, uh, congenital hallux valgus may uh, have independent orthopedic implications because the parents of the growing children, they ask uh, for the advice, uh, they have some complaints, uh, some difficulties with uh, selecting the shoes, pressure source and cosmetic defect, which is also not uh, quite important. Uh, clinically, um, congenital hallux valgus in, in, in uh, FOP is um, quite specific and quite different from the other hallux valgus uh, in uh, uh, um, in children. It's mostly symmetrical, valgus deviation and shortening, which is an important uh, sign of the first ray of the foot. Uh, different degrees of hypoplasia of the first two, which is less common, or adductility of the first two, which is quite rare. It can be combined with some reduction of the first finger of the end, but uh, it's, it's less distinctive. And uh, radiologically, we can uh, see hypoplasia of the proximal phalanx, phalanx of the first two and first metatarsal head, narrowing of the metatarsal phalangeal uh, and interphalangeal joint spaces and some ankylosis of uh, interphalangeal uh, joints. And as Peter said in, the, in his uh, brilliant lecture, it's uh, the problem with the mm, first two in the, during the embryogenesis is the uh, defective uh, mm, formation of the, of the joints and the shortening and defective formation of the growth plate of the grade two. And uh, that, that leads to uh, the uh, defective cavitation of the joint spaces. And uh, finally, in this reduction and valgus deformity of the first ray of the, two, of the, of the foot. Um, not every uh, valgus deviation, not every uh, valgus deformity of, uh, of the grade 2 should be uh, immediately uh, sent for the uh, genetic testing. Um, some other genetic conditions, like for example, uh, this uh, on the left side, the left picture, uh, the Bucois dysplasia uh, type 2, uh, also it's, it's even more rare condition. Uh, it also mm, uh, have uh, the hallux val congenital hallux valgus in the spectrum of the specific uh, features, but uh, some uh, extra uh, findings, like for example, this uh, additional, this extra phalanx of the of the index uh, on the, of the second uh, um, finger is uh, uh, even more distinctive for the for the Dubuquois dysplasia and uh, helps to uh, better uh, to. Uh, um, um, uh, refer the patient to the proper way, uh, not immediately for the for the genetic testing for the ACBR uh, mutation. Uh, neurogenic hallux valgus is also common in uh, in uh, spina bifida, in, uh, in cerebral palsy, in children children with uh, uh, syndromic ne neurological conditions with uh, um, uh, muscle hypertonus or, or hypotony uh, and or hypotony. And uh, the most uh, important is the quite is the um, uh, mm, meticulous clinical um, inspection of the two. And as you can see on the on the photo, in standing position, with the hallux valgus is is quite obvious. But uh, in non weight bearing position, the length of the first ray uh, and the position of the first two are quite uh, almost normal. And some positional deformities in children with physiological um, 
uh, low muscle tone, for example, in fast physiological uh, hyperpronation of the foot also can mimic hallux valgus, which easily can be um, uh, distinguished from uh, um, the uh, pathological condition with the uh, uh, thorough clinical examination. In gentle bilateral malformations of the great tooth is the essential, essential sign of FOP. More than 93% of uh, patients with FOP demonstrate obvious uh, congenital hallux valgus. Idiopathic congenital bilateral malformations of the great tooth uh, is an extremely rare condition. And uh, persistent valgus deviation of the first twin babies and toddlers occurs in cases of underlying neurological disorders and a comprehensive examination is required uh, for the um, differential diagnosis of uh, um, both important neurogenic and uh, um, syndromic um, hallux valgus. Um, regarding the management, the children, the parents of the children with uh, FOP uh, quite often ask us uh, uh, what to do with, what should we do something with the hallux valgus. Stretching exercises are ineffective because the cause of deformity is a congenital hypoplasia, it's not a contracture. A modification of the shoes is, is uh, the best recommendation. Spacers and insoles when pressure sores are, and callosity uh, appear. Um, uh, helpful, but they don't uh, um, um, solve the problem. And observational um, strategy is uh, the most logical in this condition. Heterotopic ossification is the um, most uh, uh, dis distinctive part of the clinical spectrum of FOP, of course. Um, and um, um, ossification appears not, uh, ne almost never appears at birth. It can manifestation um, during the um, uh, first, in, in the severe cases during the first years of life, uh, sometimes uh, in preschool age, uh, in the, uh, the age of the uh, first manifestation is quite varying. Uh, and uh, to date, there is no conventional prevention and treatment strategy for heterotopic ossification. And what we have to know all the orthopedic surgeons. Surgical treatment is not only ineffective, but it is uh, harmful and dangerous for all the types of, patho of uh, heterotopic ossification in children with FOP. And any kind of surgery, uh, for example, surgery for acute conditions, uh, for, for trauma, uh, should be uh, performed only with, uh, for the, uh, for the um, life-threatening uh, situation and uh, uh, not uh, uh, to, and the aim of this uh, surgery is not to remove the ossification and not to improve the uh, range of motion, but uh, to, to save the life, not more. Um, contractures and deformities uh, uh, appear as uh, soon as the um, ossification because the, um, the favorite uh, uh, locations for the heterotopic ossifications in um, FOP are uh, uh, close to the joints, to the major joints like hips, knees, and to, to, to the spine and uh, upper limb girdle. Uh, scoliosis and thoracic deformity in, uh, in FOP uh, we, uh, are almost um, uh, permanent finding in children and uh, in, in adolescents. Scoliosis is slowly progressive and the cause of, uh, of scoliosis mo is mostly synestosis of the ribs and uh, synestosis in the ossification along the, uh, the, uh, the spine. Bracing, uh, all, almost all types of bracing are ineffective uh, in uh, uh, FOP for scoliosis. And uh, uh, pressure, especially pressure with inflammation, pressure with inflammation and the pressure source is the, can be uh, the starting point for the extra ossification, we have to remember it. And um, uh, surprisingly, not surprisingly, but it's interestingly, uh, uh, scoliosis and thoracic deformity uh, have a moderate influence uh, on the vital functions like um, uh, uh, vital uh, lung capacity and others uh, um, because of diaphragm is uh, 
almost never involved in ossification process. It's very uh, interesting. It's, it's uh, the uh, topic for ex uh, additional investigation, but uh, um, the, the um, vital functions are quite uh, preserved in uh, uh, FOP. And uh, again, interesting, progression uh, uh, is stabilized uh, as uh, ossification point. So uh, scoliosis uh, uh, it never leads to collapse of the spine, like it, uh, for example, in, cerebral, in severe cerebral palsy, like in spinal muscular atrophy uh, and other neurogenic conditions. And uh, ossification uh, makes a kind of a corset uh, and stops the progress of the deformity at some stage. And contractures and ankylosis is a problem also in the growing children and adults with FOP. It's the main cause of disability. Uh, with time, uh, children, they lose some functions, uh, some, uh, and uh, in the severe cases, they can lose the ability to move uh, and they need some uh, uh, special care. Um, uh, results of uh, physical therapy are mostly controversial and we don't recommend, uh, uh, um, uh, we never recommend aggressive physical therapy and the physical therapy is mostly aimed to the maintaining of the daily function. Uh, secondary impairment of the articular cart cartilage after the ankylosis uh, leads uh, to some uh, stages of osteoarthritis, but uh, um, Pain uh, secondary to osteoarthritis is not a, uh, not so common uh, for FOP, and uh, um, there is no treatment strategy to date. But uh, interestingly, if we look at the, um, uh, we have the uh, quite strong um, uh, parental uh, community of the families of with FOP, and, and uh, uh, we try to maintain the co the uh, communication every year. Thanks to Frederick Kaplan, who started uh, this uh, uh, supporting uh, the FOP Russia. And um, when uh, orthopedic surgeon looks at the uh, group of children with FOP, we can find some uh, uh, common features. For example, uh, one leg is, is mostly straight and, this, and another leg is mostly flexed. Uh, one hip is flexed and uh, another uh, hip is extended. One elbow is uh, uh, more extended and a second elbow is less extended. And if we look in the classical um, textbooks uh, about the uh, in, in tuberculosis in, poly in polio, uh, and if we look at the uh, um, positions of the, um, uh, for, for the uh, um, arthrodesis of the major joints, we can uh, see, uh, see that more or less the same amount of the flexion and extension, more or less the same position for the function, uh, most functional ankylosis uh, produced by, by the orthopedic surgeons in the past, say, in the time of uh, tuberculosis and polio surgery. So the mother nature uh, stops the progress of the contractures of the major joints at the same functionally um, um, uh, important stages, and uh, uh, they uh, they almost never symmetrical, and uh, they provide children um, biologically uh, for the better functioning in the limited uh, functioning conditions. And of course, surgery for the ankylosis of these contractures are absolutely contraindicated now. It's a very positive um, story with the communication. It's maybe how, how it, it sounds uh, um, from, uh, uh, from us, but it's uh, the, uh, we have quite, as I said, quite, quite strong community of parents and children, young adults with FOP. And um, we learn a lot from uh, our patients, from the parents of our patients. And uh, it's, it's very uh, important to, uh, for, uh, it's not even more important maybe than know the basics uh, to communicate to the patients. And in conclusion, orthopedist uh, is uh, often the first contact doctor. And we have to remember the red flags uh, of for the rare conditions and the most important red flag of uh, FOP, congenital hallux valgus. I found this picture from the Italian Renaissance uh, at one of the exhibitions. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, the, that was uh, the baby with FOP, the model for the pair, for the artist, but I don't exclude it because uh, uh, those who uh, have seen uh, the 
series of the cases with FOP can agree with me that this is very compatible with uh, the, um, the typical uh, picture of uh, congenital hallux valgus in FOP. Congenital bilateral malformations of the great tooth is an important reason for thorough examination. In all the doubtful cases of congenital hallux valgus or heterotopic pacification, the easiest way to resolve the question is to perform the genetic testing, which is easy in FOP because of the um, classical mutation, the uh, major mutation in, uh, in these conditions. And the medical treatment is a very realistic perspective, and I delegate uh, the uh, role to speak about that uh, to Professor Peter Kahn. Um, thank you, Dr. Kenneth. So um, we've got about uh, probably just under 10 minutes to go, and uh, I'm just going to run rapidly through uh, the treatment modalities for um, uh, fibrosifacans progressiva. So um, uh, one of the important things that we needed to do firstly was to establish some sort of scoring that we can use to monitor disease progression. And Dr. Kaplan and others have come up with this very easy score called the CAGES score to assess the joints. And basically, if your joint is unrestricted movement, you score zero. And if it's fully enclosed, you score two. And anything in between is scored as a one. And we use the scale really to follow progression of disease uh, through adolescence and through uh, adulthood to try and figure out what's going to happen next. Uh, as uh, Dr. Kenneth has uh, mentioned, in a rare disease where we have no uh, cure, it's really important that we do no harm. And uh, in FOP, this really means that we don't want to encourage any sort of exercise that is going to precipitate a fall or inadvertently stretch the joint out of motion, which, which will precipitate a flare-up of some sort and the appearance of heterotopic ossification. These uh, in, uh, individuals run into restrictive lung disease as they age, so they're unable to generate a vital capacity. And in order to try and perform uh, to, to preserve their lung function, we do encourage simple exercises such as singing and water exercises uh, and engaging a respiratory therapist to be able to advise on what is appropriate to do. Uh, the management currently is multifactorial, as the slide is trying to show. So there are a number of different treatments that are available, none of which halt the progression or development of heterotopic ossification, but try and provide some sort of symptom uh, relief. So the inflammation that occurs in a flare-up is extremely painful and debilitating. Uh, and what we have found is that a short, sharp dose of high-dose prednisone is very effective in reducing pain and inflammation. So this is one or two milligrams per kilo, four days, uh, and typically a patient has this at hand. It's been pre-prescribed and available for them to use as soon as a flare-up occurs. Now this does nothing, of course, to uh, reduce the progression of heterotopic ossification. It simply relieves symptoms and pain. Uh, bisphosphonates have been investigated and Dr. Kaplan here has a personal observation saying that 75% of his patients in one study uh, reported a rapid improvement in symptoms and, and signs of a flare-up. We don't really know how they work. As we all know, bisphosphonates typically inhibit osteoclasts, but this is not the mechanism at play in FOP. We're not sure whether it's somehow modulating the macrophage response or whether it's modulating an uh, via an anti-angiogenic effect uh, resulting in reduced inflammation. So we don't know how it works, but it seems to work in some uh, individuals. Uh, of course, when you're thinking about giving bisphosphonate, you're thinking about either the IV versions like permitronate or the newer ones, which are just a one-off injection. And we need to take care when we're placing an IV and doing blood tests, because uh, if you uh, inflate the cuff too much, you may precipitate inflammation. And so tourniquet time needs to minim be minimized and the test really needs to be done by someone that who's very, very experienced. Non-steroidals are also very useful. So that includes the COX-2 inhibitors in preventing and reducing the pain uh, that is associated with a flare-up. 
Now, palaveratin has become uh, an, a new drug that uh, is showing a lot of promise for uh, this condition. So this palaveratin is a retinoic acid antagonist, and it was first developed by Roche in the late 90s to treat chronic obstructive airways disease, uh, and has been later repurposed for FOP, simply because uh, trials in mice found that it was able to prevent the heterotopic ossification in a mouse model of FOP. So at the uh, 2020 ABMSR uh, meeting, uh, the data from the MOVE trial, which is a phase three multi-center trial with more than 100 patients with FOP who received either chronic or palaveratine at five or 10 milligrams a daily, and that was increased to 20 milligrams daily when they had a flare-up for about a month and then reduced to 10 for another two months was shown. And basically this trial was to evaluate the efficacy of palaverotin in reducing new HO volume. And this was assessed by whole body CT head sparing. So the post hoc analysis showed that there was a substantial reduction in the mean annualized heterotopic ossification volume for patients who were treated with uh, palaveratine. And palaveratine, as I've said, was either gi was given at five milligrams daily, and then uh, the dose was increased when there was a flare-up. Now, all these doses were, of course, adjusted for age if the child was below a certain weight. One of the issues uh, with palaveratine that came out, one of the problems with it is that it can induce premature closure of the plate. And so it's just recently been licensed in Canada, but for children who are eight years and above in females and 10 years and above for males. So uh, what are the side effects of this particular agent? Uh, as it's, a, it's a retinoid, as you can imagine, uh, dry skin, dry lips, hair falling out, uh, the usual sort of uh, uh, problems that you would uh, incur with any sort of retinoid were the main side effects. Uh, and these are generally treated with uh, sunscreen, emollients, and moisturizing to reduce the discomfort that is associated with, with palaveratine. Uh, with the premature physial closure that was observed with palaveratine, uh, since this can be irreversible, uh, they recommend that all children who have not had their growth plates fused at the time of starting treatment be monitored every three monthly with, uh, with x-rays. So there are a number of other agents that are currently out in addition to palaveratine. Uh, as I said, palaveratine can slow down the progression of HO. Uh, we're hoping that it may even prevent it, but we're not sure whether it can reverse it. So there are a number of other investigational agents that are currently in use. A uh, number of drugs here that people will recognize for other different uses that are currently being repurposed. And as in the case with all, you know, in all diseases in medicine, it's probably not one drug that is going to work for everyone. And it's great to have a repertoire number. So with that, I'll end my slide show and hand back uh, to Dr. Kennis uh, to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for the great talk. Um, to be honest, I don't see the questions in the chat box. Uh, dear attendees, uh, if you have any questions, uh, we would be happy to answer. You have the chance to ask the question um, to the expert in pediatric uh, geneticist, uh, uh, um, which is not very available for orthopedic surgeons. Maybe uh, I can ask you a couple questions, Peter. Um, the, uh, uh, may I, Peter? Just well, yeah, for some, no, no, some sir, please do, please do. And uh, there, there are no questions so far submitted, and I would ask you a couple of questions, if possible, just to maybe to uh, uh, to start. Uh, my first question: uh, I was also so uh, inspired with the um, uh, great two malformations, and today you explained uh, quite clearly. But uh, in ACVR, one mutations uh, 
in children with a FOP, we have uh, mostly the same mutation in ACVR gene. It's the, the major mutation. But the spectrum of the uh, grade two deformities is quite uh, wide, from the minor shortening, from the minor uh, valgus deviation to the absence of the grade two. Uh, do you know maybe, or you can maybe you can uh, speculate somehow, um, which is the uh, why uh, do we have uh, the so wide spectrum of the deformities? which should be in in my opinion uh, quite strongly regulated by uh, the by the genes uh, in uh, the conditions which in the condition which uh, mostly uh, depending on the only one point mutation and no thank you dr kenneth uh so i think i've got a two-phase answer to that so some of the children with the atypical mutations in the acvr1 so they don't have the common r206 mutation have different toe changes so that explains some of it but the other explanation is much more simple uh, from a geneticist and as we know with all autosomal dominant conditions you can have the same mutation in the family and yet you have a spectrum of physical findings and and to this day we do not know what those other modifier genes they must be those in the body we're just simply not clever enough to detect them so that probably explains some of the variation and the other variation stems from the different types of mutations that you get in that particular gene Thank you. Thank you for the clear explanation. And my second question is um, the majority of the experimental treatments, uh, mod mod treatment modalities in FOP uh, and those uh, uh, treatment, medical treatment modalities which are undergoing uh, some phases of clinical trials, they are focused on the um, uh, uh, decrease of the uh, heterotopic ossification formation. Do you think uh, there are some uh, approaches, uh, or maybe once, uh, to the reduction of the appeared uh, heterotopic classification? Do you uh, maybe you know, or again, you can speculate somehow? Um, is there, a, there are some uh, theoretical or practical way how to regulate, uh, down regulate uh, um, the uh, heterotopic classification which already exists? Yeah, no, no. Um, uh, thank you. So, palivaritine, as you can imagine, is a drug that is not acting on the particular receptor and is acting downstream, and it's a repurposed drug. Uh, and so, we've also got more sort of targeted treatments. For example, we've got a, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor, which is going to try and actually inhibit the receptor and be much more direct. So that's another approach that uh, is called the FALCON trial that uh, is currently being undertaken in a number of centers uh, worldwide and we're, tr we're trying to recruit. Uh, but another tack to take is to look at the role of the immune response uh, in this whole process. And so, you know, we know anecdotally that suppressing the immune response may result in less heterotopic bone ossification. And so we just don't know what cells to uh, suppress because uh, if we go there with just a sort of a generalized immune immunosuppressor, you're going to get a lot of nasty side effects, perhaps for very little gain. So I think that's a that's a hugely unexplored area uh, that we that that we uh, that we really haven't looked at, and so uh, it, it's. I'm hoping that uh, you know, with time, we're going to have a few different agents, right, that can treat this medication because we don't know if monotherapy is going to be the way to go or whether polypharmacy will be better. So that's my my take on it. Thank you. Thank you again. We're very clear. Uh, fortunately, we have one question uh, in the chat box, and I think uh, uh, the question is what is the typical life expectancy, and if not a normal expectancy, what typical causes of premature death? Uh, does a stiff chest ultimately become a problem? Um, maybe uh, we could delegate the first uh, question to you, Peter, if, if you... No, thank you. So the the mean life ex or the median life expectancy is about 41, but you do get individuals living in their 50s and later on. And as you've pointed out, it's the restrictive lung disease combined with a locked jaw. So ossification of the jaw where someone can't generate a very good cough, they're unable to clear their sputum and ultimately it's a pneumonia or some sort of disease that will take their life. But in addition to that, you can get problems with pulmonary hypertension that results from restrictive lung disease. 
Uh, and so I, I think, um, uh, you know, these folks are at high risk of aspiration simply because their whole sort of swallow, re swallow response is, is just so discoordinated and affected by the disease. Uh, so that's ultimately what would end life. Thank you. Great. Again, great. Uh, and the second question, uh, what do you recommend uh, as a kind of treatment for cases of congenital pseudarthrosis? Uh, uh, in progressive uh, fibrodysplasia, um, maybe uh, progressive congenital pseudarthrosis. Uh, I never experienced the congenital pseudarthrosis of the long bones in, in children with uh, um, uh, uh, fibrodysplasia. Maybe if uh, um, you mean the uh, pseudarthrosis of the um, uh, underdeveloped uh, the grade two uh, um, with the with the phalangeal joint or interphalangeal joint, they don't need any kind of treatment, just surveillance. And the third the third question: uh, How painful is this condition? Do patients have night pain? In what age uh, heterotopic uh, uh, ossification typically appeared? Uh, and thank you in advance. Peter, uh, uh, do you what? Maybe you can also uh, just be, uh, uh, answer the question about the pain and pain therapy. So, in so the, the pain is quite severe, uh, and uh, and that's why we use uh, inflam you know agents to suppress inflammation such as uh, oral prednisone uh, or the non steroidal and COX two inhibitors. So uh, as Dr. Latimer uh, kind of said, the, the, the big toe malformation might be present at birth, but the disease is quiescent. It's typically some sort of injury, uh, trauma that brings it about, and commonly a vaccination that might precipitate that first flare up. Uh, and the deposition of bone, but that may not actually be diagnosed and it may be put down to, you know, just one of those things. And it's only until the second and the third flare up uh, occur that people realize that this is something quite abnormal. Most of the individuals present in the first decade of life. Very rarely is there a delayed presentation second decade. And I think the oldest person reported was 46 when they first uh, had a flare up. So uh, it's typically in the first 10 years of life, it's typically after a vaccination uh, or some sort of trauma, and it's very painful. Thank you, Peter. I think uh, mm, we don't have uh, uh, questions anymore. Um, and uh, if uh, I think uh, that was the fantastic uh, opportunity for uh, both of us to communicate. Uh, uh, by, um, by the half of the world, and uh, it, I would uh, want to thank uh, again uh, European Pediatric Orthopedic Society Educational Committee, Professor Sebastian uh, Farr, uh, for the opportunity to organize this uh, fantastic uh, webinar. And uh, mm, I think uh, we uh, uh, we did uh, the best we could. And uh, if, uh, Peter, maybe you have some closing remarks? Um, no, I mean, um, I, I think that um, this, is a, this is a very difficult condition. And for those of us who look after these children, it's simply devastating not to be able to do anything for them uh, and watch the disease progress. So we're all um, hoping that, you know, this new drug that is available, paloveratine, is going to be able to change the clinical course. Uh, but it's, it's early days still. Thank you again. And um, hope to, to, to see you during the, some next uh, webinars uh, in the topic of rare skeletal conditions. Thank you and goodbye.